So, hi, I'm Kristen. Um, this is my first testimony video. Um, I'm a little camera shy, just uh, bear with me here. <laughs> so, there's a lot of testimonies I'd like to share. Um, I've had an abusive childhood, I've been in a physically, in a physically abusive relationship, I've been in an emotionally abusive relationship. Um, I've died and come back to life on the operating table. I think that's the one I'm going to share today because that seems to be the one people are the most interested in hearing. Um, so I guess I'll start when I was, um, when I was 16. Actually, a month before I turned 16, I got into this relationship, um, and <laughs> he wasn't a very nice guy, we'll, we'll just, we'll just say that, um, he was verbally, um, at first he was just verbally abusive, um, and emotionally abusive, um, he didn't become physically abusive until I, I got pregnant about, um, six months into our relationship, I was 16 years old, and, and I was pregnant, um, uh, I told my mother, and she disowned me for refusing to have an abortion, so, um, sorry, <laughs> I'm just not very good at this, I'm trying, just bear with me, um, so I, I was kicked out of, I was kicked out of my home, and I was disowned by my mom, because she was embarrassed, um, she's, she said it didn't make her look like a very good mother for me to be pregnant as a teenager. She wasn't ever really around when I was a teenager. She didn't set a very good example. She was an alcoholic. She was abusive to me. Um, so I got to, I, I moved in with my mom's ex-husband. He took me in. He's always been a father figure to me. Um, so I was, I didn't have a lot of support at that time. I stayed in this relationship with this man and um, about, when I was about four and a half months pregnant, um, he raped me for the, for the first time. Um, and things really escalated from there. He would hit me like right here, just like, you know, he was very abusive. He, he threatened my life uh, several occasions. One time he brought me out into the middle of nowhere and put a razor blade to my throat and said, hey, give me three reasons why I shouldn't kill you right now. Um, I finally was, I was scared, you know, I was really scared to leave that relationship. He told me if I ever left him, he would kill me. And I, and nobody knew what was going on. I didn't tell anybody about this. Um, so, um, oh my gosh, <laughs> this thing's falling down. I, I ended up leaving him when my daughter was... seven months old, I ended up leaving him, and I instantly, really stupidly, instantly started dating somebody else, started sleeping with somebody else, and, because that was just how, that's, that was, in my mind at the time, that was the only way I could break free, like, like, once I did this, there wasn't any going back, you know, the relationship would have changed. That was my justification at the time, of course. Um, here, I'll show you some pictures. This is me, <laughs> the day my daughter was born. I was 16. Yeah, <laughs> I should have showed those a little earlier. Um, but I left and I instantly started seeing somebody else. He found out I was seeing somebody else. He didn't know who. He kept questioning me, you know, who are you, who are you sleeping with? Who are you dating now? And, you know, I wouldn't tell him because I didn't, I was protecting this, this person's life, really. Um, we had a, we had a really, really bad argument. The, it was, it was June 26, 2007. Um, the day I had my near-death experience. I woke up like it was any other day. Um, 
he was, uh, his name was Vinny. He was on his way to come and pick our daughter Jules up for the day. And I was getting her all ready and everything. And I, and when he got there, I, I, I buckled her into the car seat and I said, you know, enjoy your day with her. And he kept trying to talk to me about getting back together and who this new person I was, who this new person I was seeing. And I didn't want to talk about it. I said, you know, this, it's over between us. I don't, there's nothing else to talk about. Just enjoy your day with your daughter, you know? There's nothing left between us. So I went inside. I tried to shut the door. He pushed the door open. And I'm just like, whatever. You know, I didn't think anything of it. I just, I sat down in the recliner in the living room and I'm just like, it's over. And that's that. And next thing I know, he's running into the kitchen. And I'm like, what is he doing? He grabbed a, um, a six inch... A boning knife off of the knife rack on on the wall in the kitchen and he came back he came <laughs> running back into the living room and I just look up and I just see him with with the knife coming at me by then it, I, I couldn't do anything you know it, it was it was too late and he stabbed me right hold on right here let me see there's the scar um, and, uh, I panicked, of course, I was horrified, it was the most, uh, it was the, it was the most terrifying feeling, I can't even describe what I was feeling at that point, just horror, absolute helpless horror, I'll never forget, and just, and it wasn't so much painful, but it was, it was very, um, I felt very violated, you know, like, it just, it was, it, it was terrible. So I stood up instantly, and he and he stabbed me a second time in the back. I'm not even going to try to show you that scar. That would be too difficult right now. Um, and he dropped the knife. He ran outside, got in the car, and drove off with our daughter, our six-month-old daughter, our seven-month-old daughter in the car. Um, so I was just left there, horrified, bleeding to death. Um, my stepbrother was sleeping in his room. I, I started pounding on the door like begging him to wake up and I didn't have time to wait his door was locked I didn't have any time to wait so I ran over to the house phone and I grabbed it I grabbed some blankets for my for my stepdad's room and I held them up against myself while I was on the phone calling 911 I don't even remember what I said I just and I remember looking out the kitchen window and seeing my neighbor across the road was home so him running in the driveway. I guess they found the, the bloody phone in the driveway. I, I dropped it uh, probably while I was on the phone because I needed somebody like right away. So I, I'm halfway across the neighbor's yard heading to the door. When my stepbrother had finally woken up, he came out on the cor the porch and he yelled, Kristen! And I heard my voice and I, I heard him say, I heard somebody say my name. I knew that I had found somebody and my body dropped. I just dropped to the ground. Um, and I just, I just remember laying on the ground and the sky was like a perfect blue that day. The sun was just, just like shining down on me and I'm just like, I'm just looking up and, and I started feeling myself uh, leave my body and start um, floating up to the sky. And I was trying really hard to not give in to that to that peaceful feeling. Like I I didn't want I just wanted to go to sleep. Of course, at the time it wasn't me going to sleep, it was me dying, you know, but I I just I didn't want I just didn't want to be aware of what was going on anymore because it was so scary. Um I just and then before you know it, my, my stepbrother had gotten the neighbor and he'd gotten like, my dad was my stepdad and my uncle and everybody were working down at the sawmill down at the road. So he ran over and he got them. And before you know it, like there's tons of people standing over me and, and I'm, and I'm, I get, I just remember like saying over and over, please don't let me die. Please don't let me die. Please don't let me die. And I was, I was so scared. Uh, the... The EMTs came, and they cut, they cut all of my clothes off. Um, 
they put me up on a stretcher and put an oxygen thing over me. I didn't know what, what was injured at the time, but I had um I had a punctured lung, I had a hernia in my diaphragm, and the knife had gone gone all the way through my liver, and it came one centimeter from my heart. If that knife was one centimeter over, I wouldn't be here talking right now. Um, so, oh, sorry, it's, it's really it's an emotional topic. It's, um, so. I just remember, I, I just remember starting to really let go and just like, I was leaving my body at this point and everybody was yelling, uh, stay with us, stay with us. You know, they, if I went to sleep, I wouldn't, have, I probably wouldn't have woken up. So, um, I really started to give in. I felt, I was praying, <laughs> I was praying to God and, and I was an atheist at the time, right? No, I mean, I think I was just really angry with God more than anything because of my abusive childhood and, and just all of the trauma that I had already endured at such a young age. Uh, but I was praying. I was praying pretty hard to God. Like, please don't let me die. Please don't let me die. Please don't let me die. That's, that's all I just remember saying over and over. But then I just, I felt absolute peace. You know what I mean? I felt I felt like I just, I, I just wanted to give it. I wanted to go to sleep, and um, and then somebody standing over me. I think it was a police officer. Actually, he asked me where where my child was and who did this to me. And I remember I was able. I it was amazing. I was I was able to answer who did this, who did it to me, what his phone number was, and where my daughter was. And when when he asked me where my daughter was. I, st I started to fight again. I, I, I started to just, I really tried to stay alive. It was really hard. I, I, I felt like I could just so easily just let go and just, and, and not have to deal with anything anymore because I was already a very uh, suicidal teenager. But I knew I wanted to live by how terrified I was when this happened to me. I, so next thing I know, I'm in the I'm, I'm in the back of the of the ambulance, and they're heading to the highway. They they close the highway off so that a helicopter can come and and pick me up and bring me to a good hospital. And I remember, I remember um, being in the back of the EMT and hearing the helicopter, and then the guy the guy in the ambulance said to me, he said, um, "When you wake up." this will all be over. And that was, yeah, that was the last thing I remember until I woke up. Um, I was, they brought me to Dartmouth Hospital in New Hampshire and uh, a very good hospital. They saved my life. I mean, God saved my life, but you know, he used the people at Dartmouth to do it. Um, I went through a lot before I even woke up, actually. I, I remember dreaming. I don't know if it was a dream or or if I was encountering God or, or or like I wish that I was more spiritual at the time so that I could remember more. Um but I just remember being surrounded by this white light everywhere and I remember having a conversation with somebody and I wish it's not something that I can describe in words but I felt different in here and in, in my spirit after. I, I think it was stored in my spirit. Um, and, and, and then after that conversation, I remember feeling very intense pain, like right, right in here. It turns out they were putting my chest tube in. I couldn't open my eyes. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. All I remember thinking is, oh my god, I'm in hell. I went to hell. And it was it was pretty horrifying. Um, I had people praying on my behalf, thank god. Um, and I ended up waking up and I looked down and I had 29 staples. I, my whole, I was, I was cut from here. I don't know if you can see. It, it, it's like a, it's like a foot long 
um, I was stapled back together when I woke up. I was in, I was in a lot of pain. Um, I was sick from all the drugs they had me on. But, thank God I'm still here. <laughs> I wasn't an atheist after that. I never denied God again after that. I didn't wake up and instantly become a Christian. I would have saved myself a lot of trouble if I did because, you know, within a couple, few years I was I was in a very um, emotionally abusive relationship, which I'll I'll go into more detail on in another video. But um, that's that's my story. That's my near death experience. Um, yeah, and I never denied God again after that because you don't feel so. You don't feel so prideful and full of yourself when you're, when you're helpless and when you're facing death. Um, but yeah, that, I guess that's, that's all I, that's all I really remember from when I was dead. Um, I found out when I woke up that I had died a couple of times on the operating table. Even the doctor said, you know, it's a miracle that you're here, you know when they when they brought me to the hospital they pretty much told my family that I had like a like a 50% chance of surviving they didn't know um if they had gotten to me in time um but that man's in jail now the man that did that to me um he actually went to jail for only 10 years for doing that um and he got out in 2017 um and he just recently went back to jail for domestic abuse to somebody else. So I mean, maybe they'll maybe they'll keep him longer this time. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but um, yeah, that's that's my near death experience. Um, I'll share more testimonies in the future. I'm gonna I'm gonna be getting like a computer where I can put videos together a little better. I I'm really bad at this kind of like technology stuff. I'm, but. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to share that testimony. I've um, I posted my testimony on a couple of YouTube videos, and I've gotten a lot of um, reactions and, and comments, people saying that it strengthened their faith, and that's really what I'm what I'm trying to do is is I want I want people to know that there is there is a God, you know, and Jesus changed changes lives. He changed my life, um, and I definitely will make more videos going into that. In particular, this was just my um, my near-death experience testimony. Um, what really got me thinking about God to begin with, or, or at least made me stop hating God. Um, but yeah, that's my testimony. God bless everyone. I hope everyone has a good day.